So as we turn over to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, just a few things about the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon, and we'll see there in the first verse, it talks about the son of David, and how he's king. Now, Solomon, if we remember, was a man who did a lot of good things, but he's a man who made a lot of mistakes. He allowed his love for women to drag him to a place of paganism, at which he abandoned God for a while. And the scripture we are seeing here that is written out is written by, by a repentant man. He is a man who has ventured off into a, uh, what we would call a backslidden state, and he, is, he, is, he has been broken down by God, and he is repentant, and he is writing the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, we, we talk about the theme of the book being how we reason things. And as we all grow older, I'm besides Sadie, I'll be the youngest one in the room tonight, still we all reason things. Why are things the way that they are? Uh, the meaning of life. Why is life the way uh, that it is? And we see a lot of this discussed and sort of ventured about in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to look at chapter 1, verse 1 through 11 this evening. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. The word says that the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem... Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run to the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come. Thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come. And with come with those that shall come after. So we look at the scripture tonight. The title of this evening's message is The Vanity of the Flesh. The Vanity of the Flesh. And we're going to bring out three points tonight of the scripture. And the first thing I want you to see that the preacher Solomon is telling us here is life apart from God is worthless. Life apart from God is worthless. Worthless. Now, we can look at this from several different perspectives. First off, a life void of God has no real value, no real force that is driving it. You see, we all have a direction we are going in our life. And if God is not directing our steps, then we're in trouble already. There's a lot of people out there following their heart. Thinking because that they are full of love, they're full of joy, they're full of happiness, and everything is good. But the Bible doesn't bear that out. The Bible bears out that sin is enjoyable for a season. But the end result is still going to be hell and eternal damnation. They may enjoy the drink, the drug, the, the, the male, the female, whatever it is that their poison pleasure is in this world. And they will still find in the end themselves in the same dire situation at the white throne judgment facing God answering for the crimes they have committed against the Lord. You see, without God directing our paths, as the scripture says, vanities of vanities. And we see that without God, we really cannot produce anything. When we look at the book of John, chapter 15, verse 4 and verse 5, Jesus is speaking. And he says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. That means if we take God out of the equation, we can't accomplish anything. When we look at the things that we do in this life and when we ponder upon the things that we are working at, yes, you may make money. You may make billions of dollars, but i got news for you. It's burning up one day. You may have a beautiful house and have all these luxurious things you've created with the career you've had, 
but it's going to go away someday. When we do funerals, none of that stuff the person can take with them. No matter how much they may cling to it in the life, death will separate them from the things of this world. And they will go to one place, heaven or hell. And what they have worked at and labored at amounts to nothing at that point. It's very funny in the world in which we live, the way that mankind values another person a lot of times what they can see. What that person possesses, what that person looks like. But in God's eyes, that is worthless. Because He judges the heart. And a heart that is not possessed by God is condemned already. See, the Scripture says that we are nothing without God. Galatians 6, 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Bottom line is, me and you, all of us, are just dust. That's all we are. If God in the beginning had not took the dust of the earth and formed it and breathed the breath of life into it, we would still be no more than dust. And one day we are going to go by the way of the grave and our physical man will go back to dust. But the soul of man goes on to live forever somewhere, be it heaven, be it hell, based upon what we have decided to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. But just as the preacher says, all these physical things that we are infatuated with are vanities. They're worthless. The only thing that we can bank on, the only thing that is eternal, is what we have done with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are saved and born again, when we appear from that judgment seat of Christ and are held account for what we have done with Him and are rewarded based upon our works, those are the eternal things. The Bible talks about how our, our, our works will be judged. But it's not the works we do with, with, with what we do in this world. It's the works we do spiritually with the Lord. Work done outside of God is worthless. Second thing, there is no satisfaction for us outside of God. The preacher shows here how we are in an endless cycle. Sun rises this morning, we come to Sunday school, sun will set this night as it is doing now, the moon will be out, stars will shine, tomorrow morning sun comes up and there repeats itself the process. The baby is born, the baby grows up, the baby becomes a child, the baby becomes a tender, the baby becomes an adult, the baby has their own kids, the baby dies. Again, it repeats the process, the child is born, the child goes up. But it's a, a continual cycle until the Lord decides to end that cycle. In that period of time, we are always searching for something. But outside of God, we'll never be satisfied. Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Every single person. You want to know why we got a drug problem in America? It's got nothing to do with politics or anything else. It's got to do with the fact that everyone is searching for something. They ain't no one pointing them toward God. Simple as that. The drug dealers are really quick to give them a pill bottle. The alcoholics are really quick to give them a beer bottle. But there ain't no one giving them the word, which is the only thing that can satisfy their eternal longing for something. They'll tell you, if you've ever taught school, they'll tell your kids looking to belong. They want to be part of a group. You know why that is? Because we all have a natural desire to belong to something. The reason is we are designed to be joined to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are designed to crave for that, to long that. And, and, and I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, when we were shut down for whatever period of time there, I long to be joined together with the, the body of the church. Because, I mean, yeah, my wife's a part of the body, my family's part of the body, but I want to be with my brothers and sisters because, as the Bible says, we are to assemble ourselves. And I long for that. It doesn't, and I enjoy more than anything my local body, but it's the same when I get to go together with brothers and sisters of other, other churches. As long as they're Christian, as long as they're born again, I enjoy the fellowship. It's good because I, I can't be satisfied without it. We are living in a world that is not very satisfied. We're living in a world that's constantly trying to make itself better. I got a big negative to tell you tonight. 
This world, regardless of who's in office, regardless what party's in power, whether it's the donkey or the elephant or the right or the left or the red or the blue, whatever, this world is on a limited time basis. And guess what? It's not getting no better. That's the sad reality. That's what prophecy tells us. That's going to wax worse and worse. And Jesus will rapture the church out of here. We'll go off to be with him. We'll fly away. But we ain't going to fix this world. But Jesus is going to. Why is that? Because he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth for us. That will satisfy every one of our needs. He even says there's no sun there. He will be the light in that city. Psalm 107, 9, 107, 9 says, For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Now, we talk about good. You hear children tell all the time, I'm good, or I've been good, or whatever. But the Bible says that none of us are good. There is only one true good, and that's Jesus. There is only one true source of goodness, and that's what comes from it. That's God. We've all got faults. We've all got failures. We've all got things wrong with us. We may be good in man's eyes, but we are not good in God's eyes. Because God's standard of good is perfection. You will see this about parents, especially school teachers. We're, we're the worst at this. Our standard of good is based on our experience. My standard of, you know, I, I don't have a real high standard of good when it comes to kids because I teach school. And I'm used to kids. I teach 130 kids a year. I had 170 last year. Which means I'm exposed to a lot of different levels of good. So when a kid is unruly, it don't bother me because I said they're just being a kid. But someone who's never around no kids, they're around kids, they say, oh, that kid's awful. That's what they're used to. Well, God's standard of good is perfection because why? He is perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. It is a standard that His creation has failed at completely. Ever since the fall of Adam, when He ate of the fruit that Eve gave them, we've been a wretched mess. But we find goodness in God and in that it should satisfy our longing for something good. Folks, if you're looking for it anywhere else, you're not going to find it. You don't want to know why a lot of Christians aren't truly in love with God the way they should be? They don't really know Him that well. We talked about Esther this morning and the king. And, we, and I said the king didn't really love Esther that well. He didn't spend time with her we got a lot of Christians that are not spending time with God. Because of that, he's not satisfying their longing. Because how can someone satisfy you that you don't spend time with? Don't come to church. More importantly, the rest of the week, they don't read their Bibles. They don't pray. They don't spend time with Him. They don't have home devotion. They don't do the things that God has called them to do. And it reflects in their life. They become what I heard a, an older pastor say one time, lemon sucking Christians because they've always got a frown. They ain't never happy. Life is not perfect, but we should be the happiest group of people on the face of the earth. Reality is, death's coming for all of us. You want to know what? For the Christian, death is not the worst thing you will ever experience. It, it could possibly be one of the best because you're transitioning. You are not dying. You are leaving this world and going on to the next because you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. This life here is the worst thing we experience. Suffering, heartache, turmoil. But heaven is wonderful. We've got nothing to, to, be, to be upset and sad about. It's not to say we don't, it don't hit us sometimes. The world attacks all of us. But we need to remember who we are satisfied in. It is not in this world. It is not in our family. It's not in our job. It's not even in our local church. It is in God Himself. I read one time it said if a person quits attending church because of the people in the church. It is not God they were in love with, but it was the people in the church. We must remember, your pastor is going to do things that's going to upset you. Your brother and sister is going to do things that's going to upset you. But God is still God. He still loves you. He still saved you. The third thing tonight I want you to see is outside of God, we have no hope. No hope. That's the say, really the scary and the sad point to the, the scripture in the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. Is it shows 
how truly hopeless people are. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm a people person. I like people for the most part. Even when people may not be kind to me, I really don't have a lot of negative feelings toward people. I'm sort of hope, hopelessly optimistic in a lot of ways sometimes. Even when bad is coming at me, I think good's around the corner. But however, the sad reality is there's a lot of people I love that are unsaved. And while they in my eyes may be the finest individual ever was, they are still condemned to a devil's hell because outside of God they have no hope. We have people that we know very that we're close to, that we care about our neighbors, our family, our friends, that as it says, when we all we often pray, Lord, I just wish they would attend church. Lord, I wish they would just go to the revival. Lord, I just wish they would do this, but really we need them to be saved. They need to make that decision. And yes, attending church is a part of that. It can be because they have to be exposed to the preaching of the Word to be saved. You can't be saved without being exposed to the preaching of the Word. It's what the Bible says. Faith, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Unless the Word of God is given to you, and it doesn't have to be in a formal preaching service, you can proclaim it. It's what preaching means. Proclaim it to them right there where they are, and they can be saved. But they've got to hear the Word to be saved. But they need to be saved. The book of Ephesians, sorry, the book of Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, tell us, But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto the day thyself wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned within the law shall be judged by the law. Folks, what the book of Romans is telling us is that it doesn't matter who you are. That the law is our schoolmaster and it shows us our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. I got a lot of people I know that are trying to go to heaven based on the law. They'll say, well, brother, I don't tell no lies. And brother, I don't cheat on my wife. And brother, I don't cuss. And brother, I don't do this. And brother, I don't do that. But if you really want to knit down to you, say, all right, when was, when, when do you ever, have you ever told a lie? Well, when I was a child, probably. Boom, you're guilty. You're condemned. The Word shows us here, and if we live in that, we will be judged by that. You see, that's why we are called to repent and place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the only way to heaven. We cannot live in this unrepentant, sinful, ungodly lives and expect the, just, the grace of God to fall upon us when we get in front of the great white throne. He said, you know what? Don't worry about what I said in that book. We're just going to forget about it. That's not the way God works. If God did that, and if this book is wrong, God is a liar, and us showing up here is a waste of time. The only thing we have to bank on is that God is truth. He is the only truth. He is the perfect truth. You see, the Bible warns of this judgment that is coming, a judgment without hope, if it is not for God. You see that we talked about this morning in the Sunday school class about the only way to be pardoned was for the king to hold out his golden scepter. We know that's, that's a picture of something. Because if I go before God based on what Justin Basin has done, I'm going to hell. And rightfully so because I deserve to go there. That is justice. But I don't need justice. Well, I need, I need grace. And when I go and the Lord has saved me by His grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and when He looks upon me and sees the righteousness of Jesus, that's the only thing that helps me escape a place called hell. Folks, without God, there's no hope. When we look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we see how powerful the grace of God is. And I quote this verse quite often when we, we give invitation because it is, again, 
a perfect picture of what it means to be saved. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Notice what it's putting back to it. all goes back to God. To God. He's the source of all that we have. He's the source of our salvation. He's the source of our sanctification. I bet you all don't think kids can learn this word, but do you know on Wednesday night, my kids know this word. They can read it to you. They can tell you what it means. Well, we were learning that all month. We're learning about sanctification in Wednesday nights. I bet by the time I'm done, the kids know more about sanctification than most adults you know. It's got smart kids. Be responsible for our sanctification. Some days can be responsible for our glorification, in which we're in the presence of Him, and we are made to the image of the Son, and we are perfected, glorified the way God is. See, how can that be so? Because God determined it to be so. And if God determines something to be so, it will happen. That's why Mordecai this morning, he didn't, he didn't, you know, if 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 the queen didn't do what she's supposed to, he still says someone's going to save us, because God made us a promise. I got news for you. If God has saved you, that's it. He's determined you're going to heaven. Your name is according to the Lamb Book of Life. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God on the day of redemption. He's determined it. And hey, who are you to overpower God? Without God, you wouldn't have hope. If we look at the book of John, this last point's got a lot of flipping. Look at the book of John, chapter 14. And verse 6, the word says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Because of our sin, we have been separated from a holy God. We've been separated from our Creator. The only way we can be re reunited back to that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. I always say when, I, when I'm doing, a, doing some construction work or something that I'm sawing boards, I always say it's better to take off too little than too much because once you take it off, it's hard to put back. Well, that's true. It's true even more for our souls. Once our soul has been severed from God, which is completely beyond our control, there's nothing we could do as part of our Adam nature, that we are in this fallen world, we are a fallen creation, but until we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot come back unto the Father. But we see with the story of the prodigal son that when we come back to the Father, the, the, the Father in the prodigal son parable, he welcomed the son back, celebrated his return. And the same thing is true for a repentant sinner. When they come back to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, God welcomes them. The Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That's pretty powerful. Their creator and the angels that serve him are excited and rejoice when a person comes to him. We see, again, in the book of John, chapter 6, a couple pages over, verse 44. John 6 and 44. The word says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Well, again, this puts even more on God. And this is a big, big, big problem for a lot of unsaved folk. Because they think they're going to come to God on their timing and on their terms. It will not happen. It cannot happen. The Bible says it will not happen. And it's not that God's going to say, Nope, too late. You, you prayed the prayer too late. You're not. That's not. I'm cutting you off. No, it says they will not have a desire for God even unless God draws them first. See, that's the thing. Everything happens for a reason. You realize that? If I take this drink of water, there's a reason. I'm thirsty, I'm, I'm, I'm hot, I'm whatever. I take it for a reason. There's a reason that we come to God. It's not because we got up one day and said, you know what, I'm bored, let's get saved today. It don't work that way. Because God draws us, He convicts us of our sins, and by that power of the Holy Spirit, draws us, we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's the author and the finisher of our faith. It means He creates it. He gives it to us. And because He draws us through the power of the Holy Spirit, we come to God. Without God in the equation, we have no desire for God. We enjoy being unsaved. We enjoy being rebellious. I, I enjoyed being unsaved when I was unsaved. I thought it was great. Until one day God got a hold of me and I had a lot of shame thinking how could I go in front of a God someday 
that I have completely disrespected, completely disobeyed, and completely broken His law, how could I even dare face Him? And I was at a point that I could do nothing more than be saved. I, I, needed, I needed more than I needed a drink of water, more than I needed a breath of life. But you don't get there on your own. You get there when God draws you and brings you there. That's why the most important thing that we can do as a church in evangelism is not just go out and knock on doors or whatever. The most important thing we can do is pray. Because you and I cannot do anything fancy enough to get somebody saved. Can't be done. Um, that's why, I, like I said before, I don't get tore up. I've, heard, I've had young parents tell me that I, I come to church, my kids are too this or too loud, too whatever. I said, I, I, it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, it is what it is. Kids are kids. It'll happen. Because I got news where a kid can't overpower God. Um, I, and I'll tell you right now, a lot of times adults are louder than kids, and they don't bother me either because no one, you're not going to overpower God either. Uh, God is God. And if we go to Him, all these obstacles that are in our way, all of our own insecurities, all the, our own things that we're just not very good at, God can work over all that. He can work around all that. I said, I, I've never been seminary trained. I am not extremely intelligent. I read a whole lot because I want to know a whole lot. And I want to be able to study more and know more. But the reality is, if God doesn't use the Word, it ain't nothing I can do to stop Him or anything I can do to make it any better. God's got to use it, folks. It all goes back to the power of this and the power of prayer. That's what gets sinners saved. That's what brings revival to churches. That's what changes people's lives. That's what puts people on the mission field. That is what calls people into the ministry. That is what turns churches around, turns lives around, turns homes around. Is those things. It's nothing fancy, nothing you can buy, nothing you can bottle, but it's right there and free of charge. Acts 2 verse 36 through 41 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is Peter talking. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. That's talking about the Gentiles. Even as me as the Lord our God shall call... And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Again, notice who Peter is pointing to the whole time is God, God, God. What are they doing when they repent? Are they being sinless? No, of course not. No one has ever been sinless besides Jesus himself. What they are doing is they're turning from a life of sin to a life of serving Jesus. You're going from one focus unto another. Not only that, but he talks about how when they do this, they will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And notice how he says this happens. He said, as many as the Lord our God shall call. This means the call comes. The confession is made because of the decision in Jesus. And it's confirmed by the receiving of the Holy Spirit. There has never been a born again believer that has not received the Holy Spirit. Can't happen. You want to know how you're saved? Did you get the Holy Spirit? That's it. You can't have the Holy Spirit and not be saved. And you can't be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. I said, brother, how do I know if I have it? Well, it's a dangerous way to test, but if you sin, it should convict you. It should, the Holy Spirit should be doing a work in you. If, now, you don't always feel it. It's not a physical thing. It's not about the feels. It's about the faith. But it does give you feels along the line. There's times when I hear good gospel songs and tears come to mind. I think about how good God is. The fact that me, a wretched sinner who loved the world, now loves God and hates the world, that didn't come by me reading a self-help book or by anything else. That came through and by God. The fact that a wretched sinner who enjoyed hanging out on Sunday night and and wasting time and, and, and watching TV and doing nothing of any value, now would not miss a church service unless death is knocking at my door. That don't come by me. It comes by the Holy Spirit. 
Now again, it doesn't mean every day is a field of roses and every day we wake up shouting and hollering and doing cartwheels to the Lord, but it means that He is there, He is present, He is real, and He is doing a work in all of us that is born again. But it all comes from God, folks. Without God, there's no hope. Without God, you can't have the Holy Spirit. Without God, you cannot have salvation. Without God, you cannot even have an interest in Jesus. But with God, all this is made possible. With God someday, this, this, this small band of believers here that I have united with, I, we will all go to heaven together someday. Along with those that have done went on before us. And there's been many. And we'll all get to worship together someday in heaven. In the presence of our Savior who we, we study about and we pray to and we worship and we, we adore and we love. We will all get to enjoy that together someday. All because of God. What a good God we serve. We sing the song Amazing Grace quite often. And I think oftentimes, I've always wanted to preach a message, how amazing is the grace, and I don't think I ever have, but it really astounds me at how amazing the grace is. I don't know about you, maybe I just don't like myself as much as I should or something, I don't know, but I look at myself and I think, how could God love a wretched sinner like me? Why would God save a wretched sinner like me knowing the sins I have committed, knowing the sins I'm going to commit, and yet... He did. Yet He died for me and I will get to go be with Him and worship Him and look upon Him with all the brothers and sisters that have gone on before and all the brothers and sisters I am with now. To me, that is absolutely awesome to even think about. Folks, without God, we have nothing. Let's worship Him. Let's adore Him. And let's appreciate Him for who He is. We're going to close out this evening on page 363. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I didn't know what this song was. It just shows how God works. I talk about looking upon Jesus. Look at what we're closing out with. We'll sing the first and the third verse.